Thank you. It's really an honor to be here and, and, and to be in a room with women who are really on faith, on fire, sorry, on fire for our faith. It's a, it's a great community. So for much of April and May, uh, we were reading from the Gospel of John during, during daily Mass. And so we believe that the Lord speaks to us through his words. So I seem the best idea to shape my remarks around his words. Um, so there were three verses that stood out um, when I was praying about what to say about being a Catholic OBGYN and caring for the human person. Uh, the first verse was from John chapter 15. Jesus says to his disciples, you do not belong to the world. I've chosen you out of the world. The world hates you. Jesus talks a lot about this, about being in the world, but not of the world. As Catholic Christians, we have to figure out how we are going to integrate our faith into a world that's sometimes completely at odds with it. The first time I ever saw an abortion, I was a fourth year medical student. A woman was seven and a half months pregnant and had been referred to us for an, for an ultrasound. And during the sonogram, we discovered that the baby had a very serious anomaly called amniotic band syndrome. Basically, fibrous bands, or like strings, had been formed by the uterus, and the baby was getting entangled in them. Uh, we could see the bands cutting across the baby's face and brain and almost amputating his limbs. And this baby was not going to live soon after birth. And so the doctors advised the mom to terminate the pregnancy. There was no benefit in continuing the pregnancy. The baby was going to die no matter what. And you should decrease your suffering as much as possible. And it's hard to argue with logic like that. Um, so later on that day, they, the doctor took a long, thin needle and put it through the uterus and under ultrasound guidance, found the baby's heart, pierced the heart with potassium chloride, and the baby died right in front of my eyes. And this is the world. More than 90 to 95% of moms um, diagnosed with a serious congenital anomaly will terminate their pregnancy. And this is standard medical care, even advocated by our trusted institutions like the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. No one had proposed the other option to the mother. No doctor said, your baby is sick and needs your love. You can continue the pregnancy and it will be hard. But after he is born and when he is dying, you can hold him and comfort him in your arms. Many years later, I had my own patient who I diagnosed with a lethal anomaly. It was during her regular 20-week sonogram. It was the maternal fetal medicine doctor, the high-risk OB doctor, myself, my patient, and her husband. I wanted to be there to support her, but also to make sure that she did not get the same kind of counseling that my patient from medical school had. And I knew this patient. I had delivered her other baby. And it was a couple with a deep faith in our Lord and a, just an abiding confidence. And so we sit down with her and we tell her that her baby has a lethal anomaly, has a serious anomaly, and is going to die either in utero or shortly after he is born. And the first thing this woman says, the very first thing this woman says is, well, I believe, or we believe, that all children are a blessing from God. And so because they knew that they didn't have a lot of time with this baby out of the womb, they made memories with him in the womb. They shared their favorite meals, they went to an Orioles game, they went to their alma mater um, football game, they took a trip to West Virginia and to North Carolina. And this baby was born um, around Christmas time. And after he was born, the baby got to meet his big sister, his aunts and uncles, his grandparents on both sides. They sang carols, and they tried to fit a lifetime of I love yous in the one or two hours that he lived. And I never thought that I could see so much joy and love and heartbreak all at the same time. And this is what it looks like to be in the world, but not of the world. Pages are not numbered. So a 16-year-old comes to labor and delivery, having her second baby. And the resident says to me, we need to put an IUD in her as soon as that baby comes out. Now she is just 
reiterating the recommendations from the American College of OBGYN, right? According to the American College of OBGYN, contraception is basic preventative health care that should be offered to all women. And in order to reduce the incidence of unintended pregnancies in teenagers, we should be encouraging them to use long-acting reversible contraceptives. You know, we should be trying to convince our 15 and 16-year-olds that IUDs, Implanon, Nexplanon, and Depo are what is in their best interest. But what does the church say? The church says, the last thing this patient needs is an IUD. When you put an IUD in a 16-year-old, what you are telling her is, we don't think that you can change continue on this path, continue on this path of self-destructive behavior. You know, this patient had been there at 14 years old having her first baby, and our best root cause analysis is that she didn't get appropriate contraceptive counseling. Is that her underlying problem? Of course not. She needed parents who were caring for her and guiding her. She needed to stop looking for love and affirmation by having sex with boys and grown men. She needed to know that there was a God who loved her so much that he opened his arms and died on the cross for her. She needed to know that she was that loved. The last thing she needed was an IUD. But this is a radical departure for how the world sees. This is a radical departure from the world's lens. A final example is when a woman came to labor and delivery high as a kite and delivered a growth-restricted jittery baby at 34 weeks that ended up in the NICU because of drug withdrawal. And people were mad at this woman. You know, the staff, the other doctors, the nurses. This woman already had other children placed in foster care because she was not able to care for them, and here she was again. If this woman wants to get high and ruin her life, fine, but why put a baby through it? What kind of life is this baby going to have? And there are so many women out there that can't have babies. It's not fair that they can't have babies and she can have a baby and she can't take care of them. It's too bad we can't tie tubes at St. Agnes Hospital. And these reactions are understandable if you are of the world. It's simply the common sense of the world. But Jesus says, I have not come to condemn the world. I've come to save the world. We may not judge that anybody is beyond his redemption. Moreover, every baby he creates intentionally and knowingly. Like Michelle said in her remarks, no baby was made as a mistake. It is God himself who infuses each one of us with a soul at the moment of conception. So even though this may seem like, it may seem that this baby would have been better off never having been born, and even though it seems unfair that women are unable to have biological children of their own, the Lord and our Creator emphatically says that the giving and taking of life is not for us to decide. But how does this make sense? Well, sometimes we may not understand, but we are still called to have faith and believe that the teachings of Jesus and our church our truth, which leads to the second verse. In John chapter 6, many of his disciples were listening and said, this saying is hard. Who can accept it? Jesus then said to the twelve, do you also want to leave? Simon Peter answered him, master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I used to prescribe birth control. I thought it was great. I thought it would decrease unwanted pregnancies, decrease abortions, and empower women. Then it became clear to me that God was calling me to stop. I was on a retreat and asked for spiritual direction, and the priest said to me, when you prescribe birth control, you are participating in something evil. I said, well, wait a minute. What about women who shouldn't be pregnant? What about priests in the past who have told me that it was okay and I was just providing health care? Is it even ethical for me to withhold birth control from somebody who doesn't want to be pregnant? He said, listen, I can't speak to all of your circumstances and I can't speak to whether priests have said to you, but what I can say is that I cannot teach, change the teachings of the Catholic Church, which have been in place for 2,000 years for you. It was awful. I felt condemned and judged. And I was in Emmitsburg, and it was freezing. It was December, and I was on the grounds pleading with God, 
please don't ask me to stop prescribing birth control. Please don't let this be what you want from me. If you want this from me, I will do it, but please do not, be, do not ask me to stop doing this. The fear of the persecution I would face paralyzed me. In the car ride home, my sister was like, you're really quiet, Marianne, what are you thinking about? And I was like, oh, I am thinking about becoming Episcopalian. <laughs> but who would hear my confession? Who would give me Jesus? Who would give me the Eucharist? I didn't want to live outside of the sacrament, without the sacraments of the church. If I leave the church, to whom shall I go? I had been waiting for the church to come around on her teachings on artificial contraception. I've been Catholic my whole life. I always knew the church that, the, that the church taught that artificial contraception was wrong. I just didn't agree. And I knew many people didn't agree. In fact, I think the majority of Catholics don't agree. I certainly knew that there were priests and theologians who publicly dissented. And I thought, well, if these people can, can dissent, then certainly I can dissent. But as time passed, it became very clear that God was calling me to stop prescribing, and so I stopped. There is no happiness outside of God's will for us. And so if this was God's plan for me, I had to do it. And it wasn't until after I stopped prescribing that I started to see that birth control was not doing all of the good I thought it was. Natural family planning was different than birth control pills. NFP celebrates and embraces a woman's body and fertility. Birth control treats our bodies and our fertility like a disease. I had been so sure that birth control was right, and in the end, I learned that I was completely wrong. I had been waiting for the church to see the light, when in fact the church and Christ's teachings were the light. These teachings are hard, but I've come to believe that Jesus and the church that he described have the words of everlasting life. So now that I figured it all out, everything is great, right? Absolutely not. Which brings us to our third verse, which was not from the recent reading, readings. It's just a personal favorite of mine uh, that resonates with me. When Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 7, Miserable one that I am, who can deliver me from this mortal life? Some days being an OBGYN is really hard. And sometimes life is full of suffering and sorrow and pain. One time I had a patient who was 22 weeks and broke her water. In the United States, 22 weeks is considered periviable, which means the baby's almost able to survive outside of the room, but generally not. Anyway, she broke her water at 22 weeks, and the standard of care is to induce labor. Um, the long, if you don't induce labor, the longer the baby stays inside, the higher the chances the sac will get infected and the mother will become very ill. So, but as Catholics, we do not induce labor right away, right? If the baby's heart is beating and there's no evidence of infection, we wait. We give the baby a chance. With God, all things are possible. And this mother also wanted to wait, thankfully. I wasn't working at a Catholic hospital at the time, but she also didn't want to induce her labor. And I was like, thank you, God, for not putting me again in an awkward and controversial position. And we were so hopeful, right? I thought, if this baby lives, we will show everybody that, they, that, that, that we got a healthy baby out of a pregnancy that they would have terminated. Maybe they will start to rethink this whole practice of, sudden, of just immediately inducing somebody at 22 weeks and not giving anybody a chance. And so we waited, and we were so hopeful. And two days later, the sac got infected, mom got super sick, went into labor, delivered, and the baby died. Miserable one that I am, who can deliver me from this mortal life? I was like, God, really? And I don't say this to end on a negative note. It's just that living out our faith is not easy. It's fraught with controversy and hardship and suffering. But what I'm trying to say is that even when we feel exhausted or frustrated or, exa or exasperated, we know we are in good company. We are in the company of the great saints who have felt this as wet felt this as well, who have not been spared this and who cried out for us, miserable one that I am, who can deliver me from this mortal life? Because in the end, we are not in heaven. This is not heaven. But when we do the Lord's work, when we do whatever it is we are called to do here on this earth, we are bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. 
We are bringing God's love and light into our world. And there is no greater joy, no greater fulfillment, no greater meaning to be found in life than living out his purpose for us. And I feel very blessed to be able to do it as a Catholic OBGYN.